Uh, I can't hear you, Professor, if you're talking, or maybe that might be me. Wait, no, I'm on. Cody, can you say something now or free say something I, now? I can, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I have a fan going on. Is that annoying? Can you hear no. that? No, no, I have a fan too. Okay. Yeah, no worries. You would think I would know how to use uh, Zoom so well doing this all the time, but there's so many freaking settings, you know? Not familiar either. I don't know. Maybe my son is more. Um, I don't know. Right? Like I can do. Mm, I don't even know what that does did. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got a few more people here. Wait a few more minutes here. Uh, let's see here. I'll start talking now since I think we're probably at the point of starting. Okay. Um, obviously, it's being recorded and everything, and those are being uploaded. But let me share my screen and um, update you on the work that's being done. The class. Share screen. Share. You should hopefully all see my um, Safari page. Okay. Okay. So the things I started adding last night because it's now all up and running on the Bloomberg side would be, if you go into La Lima now, into our site, um, you should see the Bloomberg Markets uh, tab on the side, which has always been there, but there was nothing in it. You would click on that. And then what you start to see here is um, you're going to start to see um, three things uh, that I've posted. So this first thing would be um, Bloomberg created a, I don't know, a pretty high quality video that you should be able to watch that would tell you basically how to sign up for the Bloomberg access. It's kind of a, so keep in mind, it's kind of a convoluted way 
Um, they had to kind of create it at the last minute just because of COVID. Uh, they don't like giving out access this way where people could log into it, um, you know, at home using the web because that's not, not the way they do things. Now, you're not going to get the true experience. So obviously on campus, once campus finally reopens again, we have um, the Bloomberg keyboards and kind of the Bloomberg experience. You're going to be doing this on your regular old keyboard. Totally fine. You'll totally be able to do, do it. But to get to that point, you actually have to request a terminal login, which is why you'll then follow this video. And it's pretty short. It's about three and a half minutes long. Uh, uh, Jasmine, you already went through the first part and I already approved your status. Basically, you're going to log, you're going to follow the, the instructions here. Um, and as soon as you do it, I then get a notification that, hey, you signed up to do it. And then I'm going to approve your access. And then you're going to be able to um, start the process. Um, and then once you get into there, um, once you get into Bloomberg and Bloomberg Market Concepts, um, when you're doing the sign up, it's going to ask you for um, if you're when you're signing up for Bloomberg Market Concepts BMC, it's going to ask you for a class code, and that class code is right here. That way, you're going to show up as a student in my certification and analysis class. You're going to show up here. Um, I doubt we're going to have any issues here. There's not too many people in class, and so I'll probably notice if you're not appearing here. Um, but basically, I'd be able to track your progress as you're completing the Bloomberg market concepts. Um, I think we all agreed in class, although um, we can kind of see with where we're at. I thought we had agreed that um, we would, um, I would create some kind of Bloomberg um, project or you'd be able to do some sort of project using Bloomberg as a, as a way to replace our exams and to kind of um, not determine your grade, but to have some interaction and some uh, participation in the Bloomberg system. So, you know, this Bloomberg market concepts is only eight hours. It says it's going to take eight hours. I don't think it'll take eight hours. Um, Admittedly, I know how to use Bloomberg, but I've never actually done the actual formal class. So um, I'm going to try to do that this week now that things are starting to slow down a bit for me. Um, sorry, here, I just got to make sure there's no one in our chat room waiting to come in. No, okay. Um, so um, you should do this, but that doesn't stop you from just playing around with Bloomberg, which is what this thing is down here. This is about a 28 page um, document that you could download to, it's just a PDF. You'd just download it to your desktop and be able to read it. And it'll basically give you a start to how to use the system. Again, you're not gonna have the keyboard until we're actually in the classroom, if we ever get in the classroom, but everything else you'll be able to start to use. So when you log in, once you have your uh, web access approved, you'll have the access just like this. Um, and you'll be able to play around with it just like this. Um, and so I think um, that kind of, this will kind of take care of everything. I think, uh, Jasmine, I know you're um, here in class today. Um, were you able to get um, notification of my approval of your request Maybe she's... i i didn't get a notification okay uh it Was is it a, through email yeah, uh i don't know if they i know i approved it on my end i don't know if it notifies how quickly it notifies you um you know what I'll do is after class is done, um, I'll just call you on the phone separately and we'll just see um, where the status is at. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is not because Jasmine is the class favorite, it's because I'm gonna refer most of all of your questions on the administration of this uh, to her since uh, it's her as well as Cody as well as Elijah's job. But since Jasmine's on the forefront of this, um, I'll push some of the technical questions to her. But again, 
Uh, she did it even without the video. So uh, um, the video is actually pretty self-explanatory um, in terms of how to sign up for it. Um, but then we can kind of, her and I together can kind of individually, um, you know, be the technical support for each of you to kind of go through this. Okay. Um, so hopefully then by this point, what you did last week was you signed up for, um, you signed up for the, um, the CFA Institute, you signed up for those things. Um, that was um, kind of one of our tasks here was signing up for the CFA Institute website and familiarizing yourself with the um, learning ecosystem. Um, if we go over here, right, um, to the overview of the certificate, you kind of get to get in the sense of where we're going at um, here. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to click too quickly. So that, um, so that it, you should hopefully now all be on the CFA Institute um, site at this point. Um, there was a few of you who had an issue where if you, um, and uh, Levi pointed this out to me, if you create your CFA Institute, um, or wait, if you're logged in first, and then you try to um, get to the learning ecosystem, one way or the other, it doesn't work out. Um, you have to log out completely out of the system and then um, uh, lo log into the ecosystem. Let me kind of uh, walk you through this here. Now this part's, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's more important than the Bloomberg thing. I'd say it's equally important depending on what your kind of career aspirations are here. Again, this CFA certification is especially for those of you who are business majors, it's gonna really set you up well to have that extra certification. Um, but even if you're not, even if you're an econ major, it certainly isn't gonna hurt you. Um, especially to the extent that you have business applications, but the, the Bloomberg having that certification as well, it's obviously gonna really help you. So if you're going on the cfainstitute.org website for the first time, let's just presume there's at least one of you who has not done this yet. You would create, you would go to create an account and you would create the account. So after you create that account, which I'm all assuming you can follow instructions there. then you would go in here. And once you do that, you would see like, right, I have my account now, which it shows me. An easy way to do this would be if you click on my account, go to the investment foundations program directly from there. Okay, Levi is finally in. Levi, I was just talking about you. Um, okay, so this way I did it, which I think was kind of a fail safe way of doing it was I went to cfainstitute.org, then I logged, so basically create the login then just like log out, close everything, then open up cfainstitute.org again, and then click on log in. I just logged in. I clicked on um, the investment foundations program. And so now I'm taken to this. Now, you're not gonna be taking the exams the moment you get in here. You're gonna be clicking on access candidate resources. And now you get to the most important thing that's going to be driving a lot of the learning that you're going to be doing in this course. 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to do it with the, um, and I'll show you in a little bit here, with the PowerPoints I'm making, but um, the PowerPoints would have to be very long. The, the lectures would have to be very long to teach this. Um, well, I guess it'd have to be pretty close to 100 hours. Um, rather, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create um, the, the, the slides and my lecture to kind of give you the bullet points of what you need to know, kind of like an interactive study guide. But the idea is that you're going to go on the cfainstitute.org website, and you're then going to go to, again, um, candidate resources, just to, just in case you missed something here, just uh, really quick. Once I was logged in, again, just to show everyone, I clicked on my account after I had logged in, investment foundations program, access candidate resources, and then learning ecosystem. And so the learning ecosystem is actually what drives most of the um, um, course studying. It'll track kind of your progress. For those of you who have to do like Wiley or one of those others for, um, for studying, for instance, for the CFA exam, that's kind of similar to this here. Um, right, so um, I know, uh, Fries, you had asked about the, um, like the mock exams. Those are kind of like right here. And again, you wouldn't be doing these until you studied through most of the material. Um, you would enter in the date that you think you're going to take the exam. That way okay. you have a countdown for marking down things. Um, I don't know. I'm not a flashcards kind of guy, so that's just me. Um, but I would then kind of just start with lessons, right? So then once you're in lessons, you've then got each of the, um, mod, uh, each of the modules. Again, there are seven. These seven modules here, if we um, kind of close these all out here. All right, here. All right, so this first one is just how do you study using this learning ecosystem? But then we should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here are our seven modules, again, that we're covering during this entire course. Chapter one is an industry overview. So then the chapter that appears in La Lima is the same as the material that appears here, right? This material is no different. But the thing that I can't do because it's locked into the learning ecosystem would be you could read things, you could like highlight things, right? You can use all these kind of tools up here to do, to study the way that you like to study. But really the most important thing would be is that for this chapter one, in the 120 questions that you're gonna to have to do for this exam, there are five questions, five or six questions if I'm not mistaken. But the CFA Institute gives you like 25 or 30 practice questions. So really the way you do this is, right, you're gonna study the material, you're gonna, um, you know, read these things but you're gonna focus a lot of your attention on doing the practice questions because that's gonna help you do the real questions when it comes time to it. Because you're not gonna have, I mean, yes, you're gonna sign a thing that says you're not gonna cheat, you're not gonna look at anything, right? And so you'll sign it. Um, you're not gonna have time to really look up a bunch of things, right? But even if you just occasionally did it, you'd have to be super organized, which kind of makes it an uncheatable exam really the focus here would be is that you read stuff and then you're going to click here practice questions related to this topic and then you're going to again work through what those right what the answer is based on that and how confident you felt in your answer and that confidence level that you select is going to basically help the system gauge how much more or less studying you need to do yeah you can create the flashcards. Um, and again, this is my score on the um, incorrect. I'm doing horrible on my time now every time I show you these things here. Um, yeah, like I said, your industry overview. So you got 37 practice questions, 110 total in ethics and regulation, 329 in inputs and tools. You don't have to do all of these practice questions, but obviously the more you do, the better you're gonna do 
on mock exam A, B, and the final exam. Again, um, although the syllabus kind of really focuses on me determining your grade based on your taking a mock exam or those kinds of things, as I said on the first day of class, but actually now I'd like to kind of de-emphasize those things because what it, I realize it can do is it can create a situation where you're not going to be at the point of taking a mock exam until November. So you don't want your grade being nothing until November. Because obviously I would hope that many of you would start to get anxious of like, geez, what's my grade going to be? And, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this exam until after classes are done. That's totally fine. Um, that's totally fine to be in that situation, um, right? Because you might have a lot of things going on. Uh, for those of you graduating though, you might want to try to pound this out faster than that because you want to be able to go onto the job market saying you've got this um, certification as well as the Bloomberg one. The Bloomberg certification you get much faster. Okay. Um, Again, this whole video is recorded, so this will be posted. Uh, two weeks ago, Karen's happy face was on there doing it. Then we had Cody's face last week. Whoever wants to make the craziest face right now, you could potentially be the uh, YouTube image uh, for the week, uh, the person that gets to be that person. Um, are there any questions about this? I'm going to start adding more things to the Bloomberg um, portion of the La Lima site. But are there other questions about this? I'm basically going to make your homework for this week being getting set up on Bloomberg and actually starting plowing through this certification because this one's rather easy. Are there any questions about this? Any questions? Some of you could try to be multitasking as well if you wanted to. Can you uh, show me how to access the uh, practice questions again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, once you're in the CFA Institute website, cfainstitute.org, and then you clicked on my account, which was kind of like up here once you were logged in, then you click on um, C investment foundations right under the, it's kind of, it's going to show you the three types of exams the CFA Institute gives. But the one we're focused on is CFA um, Investment Foundations. And once you click on that, it's going to give you, let's just see here. It's going to give you this page. Are you on this page? I, don't, I didn't see who was asking the question. Uh, who was asking it? Sorry, I just didn't look. I just starting to answer. Yeah. Okay. I'm on the page right now. Okay, so then you would click Access Candidate Resources. Then you would click on Learning Ecosystem. And then the way that you would get to everything basically would be through this lessons tab right here. So if we're in chapter one or topic one, which is industry investment industry at top down view, you would then be reading whatever the portions are here and you could click the practice questions this way as you're reading it or just be like, totally like, I don't need to read your stupid shit. And you could just click practice and you could just start plowing through questions, not even reading things, um, right? And you could learn things by just doing the questions. Um, it really kind of depends on what, how you like to do things. But if you do the lessons thing here, um, right, you, you can like highlight things and add notes for yourself. Um, all those kinds that you can record yourself notes, I guess. Um, all that um, you can do on the CFA Institute, Institute Learning Ecosystem. All that I'm asking for at this point, um, quite truly, would be that each of you in the class at this point has either you know you've done it by this point or you know you've got to do it, 
would be that you created your CFA Institute login and you're familiar with those initial steps of how I told you of how I got to this learning ecosystem, right? So then all you can say at this point is, I haven't had the time to do it. Not that I don't know how to do it, um, right? Because that's on me then. If you don't know how to do it, that's kind of on me. At least I have to have given you enough opportunities, shown you enough ways to get into this. So you can either say something now, if you're in the class, you can say something now, or you can send me even an email and say, hey, Shiding, can we do a, um, can we do a Zoom session, just, you know, you and I, so you can show me how to do it. Totally willing to do it. You just got to tell me, because I cannot read minds. And I'm not like one of those professors that's going to reach out to each of you and hold your hand and, you know, caress your palm and say, have you, let me walk you through this all. That's, that's not my style. So if you see it and you got it, great. If you don't, I'll let you flounder as long as you need to until you reach out to me. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, the, the Bloomberg one, that's the one that's kind of coming into view. You can start to, you can watch the video and start to do the login. I'll have to do the approvals. I'll probably do the approvals in the evening hours. Um, so I'll do the first batch tonight. So if you do it tonight, uh, like now or after class, I'll probably start to do the first batch at 11 p.m. or midnight because um, I need to do that initial approval and then you kind of can get in there. Other questions? No? Okay. Let's... Oh, sorry. One, one thing here. So what I'm going to start to do now here on a slowly deliberate basis is under modules, as you get to each one for each chapter. Um, so I just posted this last night. This is then my video of the slides, which may or may not help. It may be useful to do this before you read the chapter in the CFA. Um, like the learning ecosystem or something like that. But I just created this. It's about a 30 minute kind of Cliff Notes version of the entire chapter. Okay. Um, which we can get to, um, which I'll get to talking a bit more about um, after I do my initial. What are we interested in looking at here? Okay, so um, I'll look at it this way. So I, I, I did prepare um, a slide or two, but they're on my other computer and I don't really need it to do what I wanna do. So I just wanna show you one picture. Now the Wall Street Journal, by the way, uh, you can be a subscriber like myself, a sucker like myself, but you can also access it free on the Bloomberg, um, using the Bloomberg terminals. Someone was saying something, sorry if I cut someone off. All good, I was just saying I just, I just subscribed. Good, dude, and it's super cheap. Uh, it really is super cheap. And it's like- a 12 for 12 deal. $12 or 12 week deal. Ah, and so the thing I can set you up with if you're really interested in it would be you pay um, $100 for the year and you're done. Um, so then you get like the unlimited access. Uh, plus if you're really hardcore, you can get like a physical copy of the paper, but I mean, I'm not 90, so I don't like the physical copy of the paper. But for the $100 a year, they'll send you a physical copy of the paper if that's your thing. Um, this, uh, not this. Remember how we were looking at um, Tesla last week? And I was kind of going oh, through this oh, whole- the news today. Was the yeah, news yeah, 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 yeah. That's doing today. Yeah, right so now. So Tesla yeah. like had the biggest loss like ever today. So, yeah, exactly. Today was the biggest loss. So this was performance on Tuesday. That would be today, 20.683%. Uh, Does there are, let's talk about this first specifically with Tesla. Does anyone want to harbor a guess of what's happening there? Uh, besides, I mean, they could have listened to my lecture 
Um, not saying that things, like if we compare it to class on last Tuesday, none of this shit was happening. So I'd like to think that people listened to my lecture. They saw Cody's face from last week and they logged in and uh, they were attracted to Cody's face and then they watched the lecture and they're like, shit, sell, 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 get rid of Tesla. Um, and they offloaded it deliberately. And then in anticipation of today's class, they wanted to beat the, the massive sell that's gonna happen tomorrow and they sold off 21%. Why would they be doing this besides my class? Anyone want to harbor a guess? Besides what you said last class? Yeah, I mean, you could go with the, you know, you could do a coming to Jesus moment. Sorry for you. Um, I don't know. Maybe the industry itself is taking a hit right now. <clears throat> and Apple did a, like S&P 500 in general. And like the uh, not S&P. Really, it's much more than NASDAQ has been taking the hit. So that's part of the reason, which we'll explain in a little bit. Why is, so usually the three major indexes fall at about the same amount, but um, actually let's just look at it this way here, sorry. If we look at the three major indices, you actually, I don't wanna look at futures, I actually wanna look at what actually happened. But it's so late at night now that everyone thinks who would be up right now? Um, sorry, it's all showing futures. Um, you don't need me. Uh, uh, no, I'm not going to look too much for it here. No, I mean, it doesn't happen very often. It's worth it. Um, right here. So why is, um, a little bit about what Levi said of why is it, especially if I go down here, maybe, uh, so the Dow Jones is down about 2.25%. S&P, rather, rather close, 2.78%. Yet, if we look at the um, NASDAQ, NASDAQ should be significantly more. I'm just not seeing a good way to see it here as a percent, unless I look at my phone, which I'll do right now. So if I look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ was down um, over 4%, so double that. That's a pretty, right? So part of this is a, a market shift uh, specifically to the NASDAQ. Why is the NASDAQ taking a much bigger hit? So you has got a point here. There's something going on specifically in the NASDAQ that's specifically hurting Tesla. But what else might be hurting? Now, Tesla, by the way, because Tesla is getting hit so much, that's having an outsized effect on the NASDAQ index. So it's an index. And Tesla actually, as a weight, as a weighted equity, it actually holds a lot of weight on how the NASDAQ is, what the NASDAQ is. So the fact that Tesla went down 21% is going to have an outsized effect on the NASDAQ as a whole. So why is Tesla going down? It's not the really, really shitty earnings per share. Did anyone take, does anyone know how Tesla actually makes profit? What its biggest source of revenue is? Not its biggest source, but its most um, profitable source of revenue. I'm um, guessing it's not as obvious as cars. No, not at all. No, they don't make that much. They actually lose money on cars. They make money on selling emissions permits because none of their cars have emissions, right? But GM, for instance, doesn't even sell a hybrid car, right? They've got like a one or two like, you know, electric cars, but they basically make gas 
burning cars, right? Ford makes, for the most part, gas burning cars. Nissan, for the most part, makes gas burning cars. Even if you look at Toyota and Honda, which do have more hybrids, right? And they do have some even all electric vehicles, I think, they, right? The volume would be primarily gas burning cars. But to meet government regulations, they have to, um, uh, they have to buy, if, if they're not meeting the miles per gallon um, specification that they need to meet, they have to buy um, emissions permits from other companies. And they can buy them from Tesla because Tesla has allocated all these emissions permits if they don't make a single car that even makes emissions. So Tesla at zero cost is, has these permits for cars that make emissions and they can sell them for dramatically high amounts to GM and to Ford and to Fiat and others. So they make a lot of money selling these tradable emission, emissions permits. And that's actually what's driving almost all of the profit for Tesla. If they couldn't sell these permits for emissions, they wouldn't be making any money at all. And so now Tesla, last Friday, was actually supposed to have been included in the S&P 500. And people for months had been thinking that Tesla would be part of the S&P 500, st S&P standing for Standard & Poor's 500. The 500 basically biggest market, capital market capitalized companies in the United States. And if Tesla had been counted as part of the S&P 500, then the anticipation of investors is that a lot of people would have um, like the funds, like right, like a S and P um, ETF, like you know, like a mutual fund, a trading fund, exchange traded fund, they all would have had to buy Tesla. They would have been forced to buy Tesla, because like the S and P five hundred, like that Vanguard puts out or Fidelity puts out, only buys from the companies that are listed in the S and P five hundred. They're not buying Tesla. If all of a sudden they had been forced to buy Tesla that would have driven the share price higher. So like three weeks ago, four weeks ago, some investor went on a message board and said, oh my gosh, Tesla might be included in the S&P 500 soon. I'm gonna write buy, you might not wanna buy stock, but you might wanna buy options, which I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit, which is a much cheaper way to get exposure to Tesla, right, and to get that gain. Now that it's not, right, now that we're on Tuesday and we're in the first trading day now of the week because yesterday you couldn't trade at all. Well, now we have a better handle on why Tesla did so poorly. But also, as you see here again, other parts of NASDAQ are also not doing well, like Apple, ticker symbol um, APPL, um, Amazon, uh, AMZN, right? Facebook, which, um, isn't um, isn't on the Nasdaq? I don't think it's on the um, it's on the it's on the dollar. Um, I think it's on the dollar. I don't think it's on the Nasdaq. Um, those are major exchanges. Zoom, right? Obviously, we're, Zoom is probably listening in to us saying this. Um, right? All these are down. Now, why are all of these down? The big there news. Be, oh, yeah, go on. Oh, I guess there must be some reason that influences all these industries at once that are that is dragging it down. And yep. then, and but I don't know what that reason would be. But no, but you you got the it's first kind of a group hit. No, you got the first breadcrumb. So, what would be If I wanted to, let's say that Levi and I, Levi started a company, right? And he and I are friends and he got this company to actually list its stock. And let's say the stock is listed at 50 cents a share. But since he and I are friends, he comes up to me and says, Shiting, dude, I really need you to get my share price to be $5 because then I'm going to offload all this, my stupid company stock and just be a million, a zillionaire, right? How am I, Shiting, going to drive up his stock price? There's two ways I can do it. The one way would be kind of like if you saw, uh, what was that one movie? The, the one with um, 
No, oh, gosh, I don't even remember the name of it. The one where the person was like selling all the penny stocks to like get the share price up really high. Um, the, the Jordan Belfort guy, the guy that like. Um, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, Wolf of Wall Street, exactly. Right, so one way I could do it is I could, I could personally buy a whole bunch of Levi's stock. Why would I do that though? He's already told me it's worthless and he, it's not really a valuable company, right? Or I could do what Jordan Belfort did in Wolf of Wall Street, which would be, I could call up people and be like, hey, Karen, Levi's got this great company. He's got this perpetual motion machine that will right, save mankind and do all these great things. And if the stock is only 50 cents and Karen buys a whole bunch, right? And I call up Andrew, I call up Jasmine, I call up everyone and they all start buying the stock and that drives up the price. And then once it gets up to five bucks, right? The smart people like me and like Levi just get out of it, right? And then, you know, Karen and Andrew and Jasmine and Michael, all of them are left holding the bag, right? And it collapses in price. Or if I wanted to drive up the price, maybe I could get involved in options. So that's kind of the theme of what I want to take up um, here in the very beginning. Um, if we look at the NASDAQ, I look at the NASDAQ composite. Someone is ringing my doorbell. That can't be good. It means either my child is hurt. It could mean the door is locked downstairs. There is some demonic screaming outside. No, oh, it sounds like someone's. Uh, geez, let me see. Okay, I'm going to hold the computer while I'm walking here. Uh, Who is ringing my doorbell? Truman, what do you need? Are you ringing my own doorbell? Why? What do you need? Why would my own child ring my own doorbell? Okay. Well. <laughs> he's trolling. Yeah, apparently, or he's learning how to do that thing, like, right, when you put, like, a bag of shit in a, you like a bag of shit and you light it on fire and you sit out someone's door or something. Maybe he's learning how to do that. Which oh, okay. you know, no one does that anymore. Practice makes perfect though, right? But if you wanted to do it, practice makes perfect. So then you gotta you gotta respect that he wants to, to perfect the art. Um <laughs> yeah. oh, wait, are you are you going to define options? I am, I am. I'm gonna get to that too. Yep, I'm gonna do that. Okay. I'm assuming it's not the same one as the employee plan where you like stick with them for a while and they give you a, a company stock kind of option, right? That's correct. That's correct. So if we look at the NASDAQ as a whole, down 4.11% here. Um, we can see after a kind of market dramatic fall up until the third week of March, we've been kind of on this steady hike upwards. Now, in the beginning here, the um, investment argument was that you could say, well, dude, uh, now we're going all digital. So obviously Zoom is gonna do well, right? The makers of Chromebooks are gonna do well. Um, the makers of, um, I don't know, NVIDIA, and, you know, um, all these other kinds of tech-ish kinds of companies are gonna do well in a pandemic where we're not supposed to be physically seeing each other, right? Makes sense. But I try to, I wanna manipulate the screen a little bit here. And it, it's hard to tell here looking at it this way, but there was actually a, a pretty sizable change in the pace of growth um, starting in July, end of June, beginning of July. It doesn't look at here, but really July and especially August, August was the best August we've had since 1929 um, in the stock market as a whole, which probably should tell you something if that's the year that we're talking about here. Uh, best August ever. Uh, just so you have an idea of the investment industry outside of the CFA Institute, August is when investment professionals uh, on the mainland 
uh, summer to, to summer somewhere is a verb, not a noun. So they say I summered in, um, you know, uh, Martha's Vineyard or I summered in, I don't know, uh, South Carolina or whatever people on the mainland do wearing seersucker suits. That's right. August is usually a dead month. Not much is going on. Yet, for some weird reason, in August, the Nasdaq really picked up then. But it had really been gaining momentum since the end of July. And I had been wondering about it as well. Why is it doing so well, especially in July? Now, what all of us regular investors, even someone like myself, could see by using things like Bloomberg is we could see lots of options being purchased. So let's talk about what um, options are. Um, so you can directly own a stock. That's certainly a, a solid traditional way of, of owning something. But what you could do instead is you could buy an option. Um, so you've got call options and uh, put options. What a call option does is it gives you a right, it's not obligating you, but it gives you a right to buy something. And the put option gives you a right to sell something. So why would you want that right to buy and right to sell? Because that right to buy and right to sell is given to you by, at some point in the future, that option expires. That, that ability, that right to buy something expires, let's say in like 60 days. So for instance, if I went to Tesla and let's look at what it was selling for in July. Look at that. Look at that dramatic rise there, right? End of June, beginning of July. Look at how that thing just fucking took off, right? And it's not people, it's not brokers calling clients and saying, Dude, Karen, buy Tesla, right? And Karen going, I, Karen, I'm picking on you because when I, when everyone shows up, the A's show up on my participant list first. So it's not like your class favorite. Um, so, um, right, it's the, it could be me calling up Karen and saying, dude, buy Tesla. That would be one way to drive the stock price up. But there's no way you're going to get a share price on 626, which was 191, <laughs> going up to 498 on 831. There's no way there's enough Karens in the world to make it look that great, right? Although there was the split obviously on that day. So it did, um, it was a five to one split, but this, the, the share price is on an adjusted basis. I mean, look at that, that in this time period from the lows of the market on about the third week of March to today, <laughs> that this crazy thing on 828, that you would quadruple your money nearly. It's just crazy, right? Tesla isn't four times as valuable as it was third week of March. And that, again, and don't think of the stock flip, just ignore the stock flip. The stock flip does nothing, has no impact on what that percentage return is because it's, it's adjusting on a per share basis what the price is. Levi, were you asking something? So I was, make, I was just going to make a comment or like maybe an yeah. idea to put out there. So, <clears throat> of course, now that um, this pandemic happens in everyone's home, right? So, of course, in Manager, you're going to do research about um, stay-at-home investors and like do-it-yourself investors. Do you think... No, that's, that's, no, that's exactly, you know, I get where you're going. Yep, that was exactly this upward, the... This upward swing is because everyone knows Tesla and it's like, wow, they're going to do great. And so... Yep. Nope, that's part of it. Yep, no, if you, from last week's lecture, you might remember I kind of, one hypothesis I had at that point last week um, was this, I'll call it the stupid investor theory or stupid investor hypothesis, which would be, right, person is nothing against stocking a warehouse or being a warehouse forklift driver. It's an honorable profession. Dude, my grandfather was a carpenter. Lots of honorable professions out there, right? Um, uh, but then all of a sudden, the carpenter has to go, right? It gets unemployed. And then they're like, dude, I'm on Robin Hood and I'm making tons of money, right? Um, <laughs> my grandfather, a carpenter, uh, he did get laid off once. And 
it was like one of those things like he's in a union and they're like oh you got to learn this skill right like i don't know like licensing right of being a carpenter and my uh grandfather my father was one of seven kids right so classic Catholic family, right? So it was one of seven kids. My grandfather hated studying early. So he would study for like this college, like community college class he was taking like right before the exam, he'd start studying. So he'd have like seven kids, like, you know, running around the house causing big things. And he'd be like, I gotta study for this exam. And obviously he never passed it. Um, but I, you know, that kind of image in my head of my grandmother telling me the story was kind of like, I was thinking of like, you know, someone saying, oh, yeah, Tesla, people are making like, you know, boatloads of money, just buying Tesla and then selling it, right? But what I'm trying to say here is that one of the options, one of the um, hypotheses was that maybe some of the Robinhood day traders were buying Tesla, but maybe what they were doing was they were buying options. And more specifically, they were buying a call option. So let me explain then what the call option does. Again, that's giving you a right to buy something. So let's say that I'm Karen on 626. And I tell Karen, I have to do it in a whispering voice because it's like I'm telling her a secret. I have to say to her, dude, I think Tesla is going to at least double in value by the end of August. And she'd be like, dude, I've only got uh, $200. So what do you want me to do? Buy one share, right? Which is what she'd be able to do if the share price is $191. Like, so what? Maybe if you're right, even if you're right, I make $191 by the end of August, big fucking deal, right? That's a big risk to take on just to make $191. I mean, in my opinion, that's a that's not even a switch, right? I don't even know what you can buy for 191 bucks. Um, not gonna be able to buy very much. But what if I, then what if I said to her, but what if you made a gamble and that gamble would be the call option? So what the call option would be, is she would, she would uh, buy an insurance policy that would give her a right to buy um, Tesla, let's say at, I don't know if it's at 191, let's say $225 a share. And that that option would expire two months from that date. So this date was 626. So 726 on 826, she would have an option to buy Tesla for 225 a share. On 826, let's get as close as we can. Okay, 826, it sold for for about $412 a share. Well, that was the open, was $412 a share. So let's just do the very simple question. Would Karen want, would she have wanted to exercise that option? Would Hell she yeah. have wanted? Exactly, of course she would. Now, how much did she pay for that option? Usually these options are priced very inexpensively, right? I don't know what the, the call option, I don't know what the price would be, but let's say, and I can't, uh, I could do it with some work here, but I don't want to take up too much time. Call options are generally pretty cheap. It'd be like, it'd be like a lot of 100 shares that you could buy at 225 a share expiring two months from that date, 60 months from that date. Let's just say, um, I don't know, $4 or $5. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly. Um, the options price would be so uh, just so i understand this <clears throat> a stock option is literally an option to buy the stock however yeah, you like, so, going to so the, but here's a different way of looking at it, right i can buy a million dollars in life insurance for like six hundred dollars a year right it, that's like an option right because right every year i could possibly die right uh but that's not likely given that I'm 43 years old, right? Chances are more likely than not, I'm not gonna die tomorrow, right? Despite all those things of like, live like it's your last day and all that shit. Um, it's not likely a 43 year old, relatively healthy male, it, and given the disparities in our healthcare system, white, it's not likely I'm gonna die tomorrow. Um, which means, right, that Prudential Life Insurance Company can offer me a $1 million policy for like $600 a year. Because it's not likely that that option is gonna be exercised, right? That's, and if you were on 626, 
year and you own Tesla shares and you're trying to make some money while you're owning these shares, maybe you'd want to lend them out to the Cairns of the world who have this audacious belief that it's going to rise to 225 a share. And you're like, fuck no, I'm holding on to this thing. I'm going to be lucky to break 200 by um, two months from now. And because I have that false belief, turns out false belief, that I didn't think it was going to break 225 by 826. And Carrot had what I thought was a misguided belief that it was going to exceed 225 by 826, right? So to get an options market to exist, you have to have a group of people who, have, who are very pessimistic, who don't think it's going to break 225. And then another group of zealots, right? People who are very strong believers that it's going to exceed 225. If there was ever a stock that's going to get those two kind of groups out there, Tesla would be a perfect stock to do it, right? You've got people that hate Tesla and don't understand its valuation. That would be a person like myself, right? And I'm sure there's one of the 12 of you, 13 of you, who love everything about Tesla, right? Who would buy that option. So for every, so for every call option, there has to be a put option. But let's just focus again on the call option. Karen bought this call option on 626. She doesn't own the shares. All she has, let's say, is $200. She could buy one share which was again selling for like, let's say 190 something a share, or she could buy like, um, I don't know, 20 call options that each have 100 shares a piece. Because a call option is generally for 100 shares with an exercise price of let's say again, 225 with an expiration date of let's say 60 days, 826. So, just like any insurance policy, there has to be an expiration date. In my case, my life insurance policy has a 30 year term, right? So if I don't die in 30 years, I'm not getting my million bucks, right? But that's not the point. It's not that I'm trying to get my heirs rich. I'm just trying to make sure my heirs don't end up in the poorhouse if I pass, you know, prematurely. So you right, have to buy all hundred? Yeah, so they'd be in a lot of a hundred, right? So. She's committing her, she, she doesn't have to buy it, right? She just has a, an ability to buy it. If she doesn't buy it, let's say that the share price on 826 was 150, then would she exercise that option? No. No, exactly. So then all she's gonna be out is the premium. Just like every year that I don't die, I'm out the premium, right? Because 30 years from the date I got that policy, when I die, that policy is worth nothing. So. Right, but for me, the policy's done its work, right? Because by that point, my kids are already conceited enough to support themselves. They don't need good old dads to support them. They can fend for the world on, on their own, right? So my insurance policy doesn't need to exist anymore. Just like on 826, right? The point where Karen can no longer uh, theorize what the price is gonna be. On 826, if the price ended up being 150, she's only out the insurance premium. Expiration date was 60 days, it was 100 shares. Strike price, that's called the strike price. The strike price was 225. And if the price ended up being 150, she would not exercise that strike price. She would not exercise this option. She wouldn't buy it. So the only thing she'd be out is the premium. Let's say the premium being $200. Let's say she bought $200 of options. But think about it. For 700, let's go back to the life insurance example. For $700, I bought a million dollars of life insurance. That's, a, that's actually what I paid. I paid about $700 for a million dollars in life insurance. So just imagine Karen could buy either one share of Tesla for 190. And I don't know again what the options price was on that date, or she could buy, let's say, 1,500 shares as an option, right? That she could choose to exercise or not. Or if she doesn't actually want to take ownership of the shares, she could sell her call option to some other sucker on 821. Because on 821, the share price was already 410. And she still has this contract that's still good for five days, which says 225 strike price. 
Now, what price do you think that premium is going to be? Is it going to be a really high premium or a small premium to buy this, to buy this call option for 225 strike price expiring on 826? High premium. Extremely high because it's almost a certainty that the share price is going to be greater than 225 on 826. If on 821, it's already 408.95, right? Does that make sense? They can make money off of selling that option. But it'd be like me. It'd be like me buying an insurance policy when I'm suicidal, right? Which is why insurance companies don't generally um, either issue policies if you're in that state of mind, or they exclude paying out on the policy. You know, if you do commit suicide for at least a few years, right? Um, because, right, if I'm suicidal and I'm like, I just want my kids to be all safe and sound, so I'm going to call up Prudential and buy a policy, right? Um, then I could turn a $700 policy instantly into a million dollars, which is kind of what's happening here on 821, right? On 821, the true price of the policy, the insurance policy would have to be very high, right? Pretty darn close to a million dollars. Because the only way I'm get, they're getting out of paying it is if there's some intervention or you know something happens where I change I have a change of heart. In this case, on 821, the only thing that's making it be less than 825 is something monumentally happening that's changing it dramatically. So let's say 826 was not the expiration of that option, but let's say that it's 910. Now look at what's happened, right? Now the share price has fallen from 498 to 330 in a little over a week. That's pretty significant drop, right? And today again dropping 21%. Now those call options, is the premium becoming less expensive or more expensive? Less expensive to a great degree. Less exactly less expensive, right? Because now people are realizing, oh, maybe Tesla wasn't the, right it's already down in the aftermarket and trading is already light in the aftermarket look at that it's down six bucks so i'm down almost two percent even in the after hours which is basically consisting of like freaks and weirdos are the only ones that are in the aftermarkets in these evening hours um, um i have a question so yeah when when you're selling your option well first when you're buying your option you're buying the right to buy shares at a certain strike price Correct. but when you sell an option um you are selling your right to buy the shares at that strike price so are you collecting the the premium the the rise in the premium or are you collecting? correct you're you're you're, cor you're you're collecting the premium which if the price already exceeds this let's say the strike price is 225 if the price already exceeds 225 the premium is right the, the premium is going to be pretty high because it's it's either a certainty or it's a near certainty. Imagine what the price of an option would be the day before the, the exercise date, right? 825, right? On 825, you pretty much know what's gonna happen on 826, right? So what that would mean is that the premium is gonna be pretty darn close to um, that 225 price because, right, that's the, the, the exercise. Um, that's the extra, the, the strike price, the, the, right? Because it's, it's a near certainty. Sorry, not the strike price, the, um, the, the share price, not the, not the strike price. It's gonna be pretty close to the share price because what happens on the exercise date is that the share actually has, to, if you exercise it, that's gonna be delivered. If the strike price was 225 and on 825, Cody, you were trying to sell it, how much would you expect? Let's get really closer. 825. What would you expect the premium to be on 825 for my strike price of 225 call option? What would you expect my premium to be? God, uh, I have no idea. It's going to be pretty darn close to $400. And the reason why it's going to be pretty close to $400 is because it's likely, let's say that Karen is the owner, it's pretty likely Karen's gonna exercise her option, right? Because 
it obviously exceeds 225. The only reason why she wouldn't is if she forgets, right? Which is always possible. But it's pretty much certain she's going to exercise that option, which would mean that the on the other side of that trade is the person who owns the share, which is now going to have to give Karen that share for 225. Right, because that's what our option is. Even though the share price is 400, let's say that the person on the other side of the transaction didn't actually own the share. But they sold something they didn't own. You what would that other it. person have to do? Buy the share. Exactly. So now that person is going to have to go out on the market, buy a share for $400 and give it to Karen for 225. See how you could lose money very, 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 very quickly. Especially if what exists in the options market, especially is that you can have a margin account and you can do this even in Robinhood. You can have a margin account. So let's say Karen only has 200 bucks but she wants to buy a million call options. I don't think she could, I don't think she'd get that much liquidity, but she could buy a million call options. Let's say if she had enough money, which would give her an outside bet for um, that strike price. But the, she's either gonna make a lot of money or she's gonna lose a lot of money, right? So in roulette terms, it's like putting all of your money um, on red or black, right? She's either gonna make a ton of money or she's gonna lose a lot. It's not really a, it, it's really a binary condition here at this point. Um, is that the same thing as pretty much leverage trading? Exactly, that's exactly what that is, yep, exactly. So going back to what I was originally saying, if I could have gone back in time and at the end of June whispered to Karen, I think I can make you a lot of money by the end of August the traditional like grandfather, the way your grandmother or grandfather would do it, they would say, well, buy the share, right? And she could have bought one share at 200 bucks, right? But the fast way to do it, um, right, would be she buys the options. She can buy many more shares potentially at that 225 strike price and then exercise those options to the, right? She can sell that call option at any point but if she waited until 8.25, dude, she was home free by that point. Now, here's what happened now, looking to the most recent days here. Why is it down so much? Because there's some call options here that are not expiring until 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, right? I'll go on and so on and so forth into the future. And everyone was driving the stock price up, thinking that Tesla was gonna be included in the S&P 500 and then last Friday, it was announced it wasn't. So then everyone's now saying, oh, fuck, now I'm, call I'm holding all these options, these call options, and I actually want to get rid of this thing. And I actually don't think that, right? I mean, a few more days from now, right? We had that 225 strike price might actually not be that valuable anymore, right? Karen could now lose money in the amount of her premium, right? And if she was on the wrong side of the trade, if she was on the other side of the trade, she could be losing the share price as well, right? If she was um, more of a pessimist than an optimist, right? Because the, the pessimist in Tesla is doing the other side of this trade. They're not doing the call option, they're doing the put option, right? Because the put option would be saying, um, I don't think, um, it's going to reach 225, right? So you're going to you're going to just pay me the premium, and I didn't actually have to deliver you the shares, right? So if I had wait a few more days here, and I hit and I go below 225, Karen's just going to give me 200 bucks, and she's going to have nothing to show for it except empty pockets, right? Or even better, if she got leveraged, right, and I get like a whole buttload of money, and I didn't even have to give her any shares because the share price ended up being less than 225. But this is where, if you look at the markets now, what's happening here, if you had asked me last week, last week I could see on Bloomberg that there were a lot of call options and put options, there were many more call options on Tesla, but no one knew 
who the owner was. Going back to what Levi was saying, so then maybe it was the carpenters and the warehouse workers and the others that were buying all these call options. That would be a lot though. I mean, that, that, that would have to be a lot of, um, there'd have to be a lot of money out there. Um, and it's not likely that there was enough out there, but it actually gives me a chance to talk about my favorite. Does anyone remember the name of the company that I was really going on a rant and a rave on last fall? That was going to do an IPO last fall. Um, that's the one that SoftBank owned. The yep. we were. Um, we worked, that's right. Yep, exactly. And just to repeat what Levi just said, SoftBank. It turns out that SoftBank bought a lot of options. In fact, TikTok. Yeah. Someone asked me something. I'm going to say TikTok. Oh, I said it's a TikTok, but I think I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so SoftBank bought $4 billion in options. Four billion dollars in options back in late June, early July, that tech stocks would go up in price. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Not TikTok. Um, so Apple is doing their own processor now, kind of. They're saying it's their own processor, but they're <clears throat> they're using ARM, which is a yep. British company. Mm -hmm. um, they're using ARM processors to make the Apple processor. However, ARM used to be publicly traded, but they were taken off the market. And SoftBank is now the one, allegedly, the other ones that, that own them. And they've been that way since 2016. Okay, so let's look at Apple. Apple since uh, July, um, since July, just July, has gained $700 billion in market value since the end of July. Is Apple that much more valuable of a company to have gained $700 billion in market value since the end of July? Or in the case of Tesla, we saw that it doubled since the end of July. The only way it can do that is because uh, largely SoftBank. SoftBank went out there and SoftBank is, so you have an idea of the understanding of what that, of what that business is. It's a business based out of Japan and it's, it's not a bank, despite the name of it. What it does is it makes strategic investments, kind of like a venture capital firm. Um, it makes strategic investments in non-listed companies. It makes investments in companies that are listed on the exchanges. And it spent $4 billion to buy $50 billion in exposure. So beta, basically a $4 billion insurance premium to make $50 billion in exposure, right? To get a 50 billion, not necessarily profit because you have to subtract the premiums, but a whole bunch of money, many times what the $4 billion premium was. But last week, it was revealed that SoftBank had that exposure. So the only thing we knew in July was SoftBank had announced in July that it had bought, um, I wrote it down here. Um, we know at the end of July, uh, there, was a, there was a filing that SoftBank had bought $4 billion in shares in Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix, and Tesla. And it didn't disclose any options. And it didn't have to at that point. But what it did most likely is that after it made that purchase of $4 billion in shares, it then bought lots of call options betting that the share price would go up. So think about this. The professional investors out there, if they're trying to predict the share price in the future, they're trying to look also at what the strike prices are gonna be in the call options. Because that's gonna give you a sentiment of what the market thinks the share price is gonna be 60 days into the future, right? If everyone 60 days in the future thinks it's gonna be 225, that means something. I mean, it might mean that it's going to be close to 225. Right? Confidence. Exactly. Or what it basically means too is that people might have to exercise those options on the other side. But what it's going to mean here is that if everyone thought that Tesla was going to be double in price at the end of August, everyone kept betting that it was going to be 
double that price at the end of August. And so everyone went out there and did that, right? Bought all those call options. Then SoftBank reveals, dude, we were the ones that bought all those call options. And now the rest of the market is like, oh, dude, we thought everyone thought that the share price was going to double. It turns out that just you, SoftBank, thought the share price was going to double. So see how that information that we thought as investors that we thought was good isn't as good as we thought it was, right? Because now it's just SoftBank, which has a lot of money, but still it's just one entity thinking that the share price of Tesla was going to double. No way. So SoftBank literally was like a hype man? Exactly, 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 exactly that. And now that we know that SoftBank was the height, was the Jordan Belfort of the, um, of the tech sector, now everyone's like, oh, I don't actually think that tech is as valuable as it used to be. Plus, I mean, not that the pandemic is ending, but right, how many people need a Chromebook at this point, right? Anyone who needs one probably owns one, right? Everyone that needs an iPhone, yeah, people are going to upgrade to 5G, but, right, I mean, 5G as a service isn't everywhere yet at this point anyway, right? Um, you know, um, Zoom, right? Uh, Zoom is actually still monetizing what it does, right? Because, you, I mean, even though I'm using the, the paid version, most people use the free version, right? So they're still monetizing the asset that they have. Um, so with all that said, maybe then people are, or, or again with Tesla, you know, now it's not in the S&P 500, right? You could even read this article in the Wall Street Journal. You could read so why about did, why. Why did SoftBank do this? Were they trying to do a money grab? Were they like, exactly. no, exactly. they tried they tried to hype the market and risk the right time. They sell everything they got. And then we're all like duped and holding the, the, the shitty bag of money that they left behind. Exactly, because exactly. they made some bad bets like we were. Um, the big how much, oh, how much of this was SoftBank and how much of this was the stupid investor or that's, was it? No, or, so that's, that's kind of the question out there right now that, right. Cause the question is, is there another player smaller than SoftBank, but big enough that we know, right? So the only thing we kind of, um, I saw an article here in the wall street journal here at some point, and I don't know if I can. Um, well, to comment on that, I really do think the stupid investor phenomenon is a real thing because once again, I, d I did do some research into these kind of investors and how they've been operating recently because of, <laughs> lo and behold, the summer past summer class in Managerial Econ. Right. And the biggest thing is like, they have this thing called financial technique. They coin it, they coin this term fintech. and. Right. It's just, this is like becoming very popular among a lot of platforms. I mean, just look at Bloomberg. They're moving, they're making their, they don't want to do it, but they're making their platform accessible from home. And because mm -hmm. it's so easy to access that technology from your phone or from your computer, it's making people, these people start trading and create this phenomenon. So it might be bigger than we think is uh, well, look at the this. So, point of this. Yeah, so here, I mean, look at this, right? And I'm, I'm just typing into Google News here. So it looks like they're already tightening the eligibility requirements for the Karens of the world to, to get her options, right? So look at this, right? So this would be option kid cowboys and the Wall Street sharks, right? Sounds, look at that, hippies and whatnot, right? Um, look at this, so right, you've got a Slack channel here, $20 per month subscription Slack channel for options traders, right? So the Karens of the world could go on this site get the trades that they need to do and then do those trades, right? So look at that, right? So, so that's what I don't really know. Um, uh, and that question is, the question would be is, is, is this Robin Hood thing, is this as big as we think it is? Or is there another player smaller than SoftBank, but just large enough to also be driving this? Right? Because all these people, right? The unemployed, warehouse worker, you know, he's just right, got a $200 a month, let's say, to play with. That's not really driving most of this, I don't think, but maybe there's enough of them that I don't know, right? Um, you like, look at this. So, um, literally nothing on the boys and prayers. NBA Young Bull, good morning, future millionaires. Is it 9.30 yet? That would be the opening. 
So look at all these people talk. Jeez. Um, going back to my thing last week, you just got to think that. Um, you know, I know. think it is bigger than right. we that's, think, that's, that's, but there could be call, another. These are the call option buyers, right? Do you trust these two people here? Um, They've got billionaire status with $1,200 stimulus checks. Uh, really billionaire status? I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, I, I have I, another question. Sure. Um, so uh, given that Corona has increased the demand and also the price of products uh, because our inability to keep up with the supply, do you think those company profits per product um the, the increases in profit per product is driving a profit for the company it's probably not driving a profit bill that much right because their costs are contained on the other side right so think of all the supply issues right they're still sourcing it from east asia whatever their products are and now they have to compete for warehouse space with you know warehouses that have ppe and other things right so they're so their costs are probably going up as well um, okay. So I, I suspect that the operating margins, they're probably holding steady, um, if anything at all. Um, I really do think that the, it's hard to understand why Apple would be $700 billion more outside of just the fact that it's got to be options trading. I mean, so look at this, right? And I'm just kind of scrolling through this article here, right? Robinhood. So you've got number of shares more than doubling. Um, I don't know what date we're talking about since here. TD Ameritrade, another kind of popular warehouse worker kind of trading, almost doubling, right? E-Trade, that's kind of your old grandfather style, 56%. Schwab, 24%. I mean, all of these are ones that you as retail traders would all be familiar with these names. And obviously since, oh yeah, quarter one, quarter two, sorry. So the pandemic starting in quarter two, which would be end of March. I mean, look at that, right? Everyone now saying, oh, I guess I'm not working, so I'm gonna take my $1,200 check and start buying shit. Um, and that's what's driving all of this here. You know if yeah. Apple um, releases quarterly financial statements? Oh, it would, it absolutely would have to, yes. I don't know what date it did though. Um, it would have just finished, it would have just, it would have just done it. Oh yeah, here we have this option here. So, no, I have to no, go from what you were saying, Levi. I was thinking of this in the back of my head. So some of these options traders, uh, this guy uh, did a bunch of trading and the options trades put him in uh, debt more than $730,000 when he was 20 years old because he was doing on the opposite side of it. Uh, and then he killed himself because he was now $730,000 in debt. It turns out that he actually wasn't. Um, Robin Hood just didn't show it correctly because he was on the, the other side of the trade would have cleared and he would have been even. But mistakenly, Robin Hood showed him temporarily $730,000 in debt. Um, and so then he killed himself, unfortunately. I remember reading that story. It's pretty sad. Yeah, exactly. So this is the options trading on the other side. Um, oh, look here. Making wrong bets is easy. According to Options Clearing Corporation, most contracts expire worthless. Um, more than 20% expire worthless. Only six. So then what's the difference between this 20% and this 6% in the money? Um, <coughs> that would be where they make something, but they don't make a profit. That would mean that the option was fairly priced. Because remember, Karen had to pay a premium for that 225 strike price. So what if it was between, if it was 226, right? She made a dollar in profit based on the strike price, but she still has to pay the premium. So at the end of the day, she still lost money, right? Even though the strike price was lower than the actual price. So it's not like this where it expired worthlessly because if the share price was 226, does Karen exercise the option? If the strike, if the strike price is 225 and the market price is 226, does she exercise the option? 
Um, uh, I guess it depends, but... Nope, it doesn't depend. Yes, yeah. she wanted to get your money premium back. So at least, no, she won't get her premium back. Nope. She'll make a dollar. Let's just say if she bought one share, strike price 225. And on the day of expiration, the share price is 226. Would she buy a $226 share for $225? No, she would sell her option, right? Well, she can't because it's the expiration date, let's say. Oh, on the expiration date. Um... So, so another way of reading that is, so if I said to you, strike price 225, today is the expiration date, market price is 226. Another way of saying that, another way of rewording that would be is, would she buy a $226 share for $225? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But now here's the problem that goes a little bit to what you're saying, Levi. The problem is that she's gonna do that and she's gonna make a dollar per share price, but she's still gonna to have to pay her premium, which might be $200, let's say. So that's where she's gonna be in between here, where she didn't lose all of her money. So it didn't expire worthlessly because she did actually exercise it, but she only made a dollar her option contract. So that's why, right, she's not in the money, meaning she paid off her premium and now she's getting something above and beyond that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you say, when they use the term in the money, that means I've made back all of my, I paid back all of my premium and now I'm getting a strike price that allows me to make more than that even. Is that clear for everyone? Okay, um, I'm not hearing anything yet. Um, it is 6.30, let's take at least a 10 minute break. Let's resume at 6.40. I'm gonna pause my recording now and I'm gonna come back on at um, 6.40, okay.
Getting there now. Six four one. Plus, I'll start talking again. So, I want to give me a heads up that you can hear me. Yes. I can hear you. Excellent. Okay. So, um, want to know more about options? Well, there's two ways we can do this here, right? So, fortunately, with Bloomberg, we can do that pretty easily. But again, my good old favorite Yahoo Finance can also tell us quite a bit. <clears throat> and you would see here, I've got options as on finance.google.com. I have options right here. Now this is gonna be more dated here, right? But I can see what the contract name is, right? It's like an insurance contract. That's what the contract name is that doesn't matter these are all tesla um and um you can see that these options are being traded right and these are the last dates are being traded so they're being traded today here are the strike prices but that doesn't really matter right what really matters is what's the expiration date and how long are you going to hold on to this right so that's kind of what's um going on here but look at what the premium is and that people are paying for it right like Let's just look at this one here. If the strike price is 20, how likely is it that someone would exercise that option on the expiration date? Unlikely. Uh, likely, right? Like, uh, did you say Unlikely. likely? Yeah, like, right? Because it's gonna be probably more than $20. I don't know what the expiration date is here, but. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I misunderstood your question. Got it. Um, does it say with the, right here. 9-11-2020. So do we expect by Friday that it's going to be more than $20? Probably, right? Um, unless the apocalypse now happens. Um, so the premium price for that contract is three thirteen thirty four. dollars That better be pretty darn close to exactly what the share price is, right? And we would imagine as we get closer to Friday, that that's even gonna get closer as a premium to 3.30. Now, if I take something more out there, I'm um, just, I'm, this is my first time looking at it. So I'm looking at this as the first time as you are here. Well, let's just pick something crazy. 12.20 strike price. This 1220 strike price. Is that really the strike price there? Why would it be? Oh, that's on the opposite side. Sorry, I was like, why is it so? Um, no, that makes sense. Let me go back here. Because these are also, also going to be um, call options and um, put options here. Um, so it's the opposite side of this, which I haven't focused much about, but it's basically the opposite would be the other side of the trade, the, um, the put options. Um, so see here, what Google Finance does for the warehouse worker who's doing options trading, in blue, they're highlighting those that are in the money, right? Which would mean they make money after and beyond the, um, the premium price, right? Because you would actually right here, right? If you paid 313 for that premium and you had to exercise it, so add 20 bucks in there, so now I'm at 333, that's still less than um, what Tesla was trading for, right? I think, yeah, 313, 333, right? Um, Sorry, they're just showing, sorry, they're showing it not as if I'm exercising the strike, but I'm trading it before it's before the strike price. So all of these here would be where the person would pay a premium and still be expected to make money. Obviously we can see here with a lot of blue here going out, 
people are still pretty optimistic about Tesla despite this short-term worry here. Now, what about the volatility of the premium price? Well, there's not gonna be very much volatility here because these people might just hold on to their insurance contracts. Where you really get the volatility is the further out you go. And the further out you go um, for a strike price of 800, for instance, um, right, you, then you're kind of depending on what does the market think that that, that option is going to actually be exercised, right? Um, volatility would be, it might or it might not. Um, now, this is not by any means intended to be a, um, uh, this is not intended to be by any means uh, teaching you how to trade options. Um, it's not, uh, but there's, well, there's a $20 Slack channel you can subscribe to that can teach you more about how to do it. It's just, it's honestly a little bit too, I know that's where the big money is, but it's also where more risk and I'm willing to take on is, um, um, it's probably a good way for many of you as 20 year olds to, to make a lot of money. Um, but fortunately too, you're gonna be able to learn a lot more about options once you get into Bloomberg as well. Because one of the um, Bloomberg modules um, can take you through, um, can take you through that. Um, if it's a little bit further to the right here, as I was showing you the screen, um, it would show you um, um, uh, options. So you can actually see the options trading in real time using that. Now, again, Bloomberg, you can't use it to trade options, but if this today's discussion is of any interest to any of you, you could, I don't know, set up an account on Robinhood and start trading options um, for very little money. Um, and you just have to expect that you're probably going to lose money too. Um, okay. Um, so that's what I've been thinking about this past week. Something unexpected like Japan SoftBank having that big options trading, which all of a sudden makes, allows me to make sense of a situation that last week I kind of said, geez, I just don't know what's going on in the market. I mean, I don't know if we could look back to the video that has Cody's face on it. We'd probably see me at least at one point saying, I don't understand why the market's valuing Tesla, what it is. And it turns out that it really wasn't. It was just actually the options traders that were driving up the price, um, making it think, making us think that um, there was more going on there than um, it was actually the case. Okay, um, that ends my news. <laughs> it's an hour and 49 minutes into it. Um, I want to go back into 26 minutes remaining. Um, I want to go back into the CFA Institute website here. One second, I just need to plug in my computer here. <clears throat> Jerry, were you saying that you, Jerry, are you still on? I didn't see if you were still on or not. Uh, yes, I'm still. Uh, don't you, were you saying that you trade options or no? Uh, cryptocurrencies. Crypto, that's right, crypto. Uh, I guess there'd probably be options in that market, wouldn't there be, or no? Uh, no. There's no options in, that's surprising actually, but there's not. Um, hmm. um, no. And were you buying again Ethereum? Is that what you were saying you were buying? Oh, no, I never said that. What do you buy? A little bit of everything, mostly Bitcoin. The old grandfather of the group, right? Uh, yeah. How many lectures uh, have you had about Bitcoin, huh? Oh, God, Jerry, if you could hear them all. Um, 
Now and again, you know, I fully admit, you know, part of it is, is me, right? Part of it is me being old fashioned and right, making sense of a crypto market and not understanding enough of all the players that are in this market right now. I don't know, Jerry, safe space. How have you been doing this year on Bitcoin? What's that? What? How have you been doing on Bitcoin this year? What? Oh, it hasn't been that bad. I mean, it's been, like it popped recently, that's about it. Okay. But yeah, I see that, I see that. I see that. that recovery, but that was along with the uh, stock market as well. Yeah, I'm looking at this now, yeah. Hmm. Uh, one second class. Uh, Truman, did you need the room? Truman. Well, can't tell. I'm using my child's desk here, so I'm like a oversized gargantuan in my little child's chair. Um, hmm. Okay, you give me a sense here. Hmm. Okay, but Jerry, what would you say if if I were if I were like, dude, Bitcoin is not where the action's at. Like, what if I wanted fast action? What cryptocurrency would you suggest I get into? Ethereum. That's the one I keep hearing about from every like fast money maker in this space. Is that true or? Uh, not really. It's it's more like leading right now, but it's not really the, it's not gonna get to have the most potential. I see, okay. It'll be the like the smaller market cap, more dangerous. Mm -hmm. I see. If you wanna keep it safe, yeah, Ethereum, Bitcoin. Okay, while I am Okay, I'm logging into Bloomberg right now. Give me one second. Okay, you should all be seeing my Bloomberg screen here as I'm logging in here. So pretty soon, if you do what you're supposed to be doing this week, pretty soon, uh, hopefully during this week, you're going to be able to get this Bloomberg login screen here. I want you all to use it a lot. Don't just stay logged in for nothing, but um, use it a lot. Oops, waiting for my goes through here. Could someone confirm that you're seeing my screens loading up here in Bloomberg? I see, you see your screens loading up. Perfect, excellent. Okay, so when you log into Bloomberg for the first time, this is all kind of the mess that starts appearing. You can. Um, for me, I usually have it on two monitors so I can kind of spread things out. If you're kind of, a, I'm doing this on the laptop right now, so I don't have that kind of um, spreading out. Um, so, um, News. Tesla. Okay. 
Okay. So what I can see here again for Tesla, not much different than Google Finance. So then you'd be like, dude, why'd you buy this? Oh, Shane, what's going on here? Um, now the value here of this is where I can start to look at its corporate bonds, which is not um, investment grade. That's gonna be part of it here. And once again, investment grade is A or better, right? Correct, yep. An investment grade would be A or better. Um, again, I can kind of track here kind of again what's um, going on for the company as a whole here um, within the market. But probably more interesting than that, right? So if I want to see how many um, shares um, are being lent out, for instance, right? I can actually see how many shares, um, I can see the amount of shares, the short interest, how many shares are being lent out. Almost, well, let's just say, let's just round it up, 10%. 10% of the shares are being lent out uh, from, of the owners of the shares are lending them out to the options buyers, the Karens that want to buy the shares, but actually just buying the option calls. So these shareholders, the 931.8 million shares that are out there, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, sorry, I, mis I misread that here. Um, our float here, 6,742 million out of the 931 million, meaning the float is actually, sorry, closer to 80%. There's not actually a lot of owners of Tesla. Most people are just buying and selling it to make the profit on either side, right? They're not just standard holders and buyers and holders of the shares. They're buying it with the intent to, to operate in the options market. That's pretty notable. I think, you know, in my opinion. Okay, now let's go. So I went into related functions menu. Now I can start to look at the trade analytics, right? And I can look at the derivatives and the option monitor. They just had a stock split. They did. Uh, when did we see that? Like a five, uh, one for five. So this uh, yeah, obviously. Yeah. So this is, so look at the, the way that this screen does it, which is better than obviously, um, which is better than uh, Google, uh, Yahoo Finance, would be you've got the two sides of the market right here. Um, the left-hand side here, you've got the calls, right? That would be again, the Karens wanting to buy the shares for a strike price in the future. And then on this side, which is I think a convenient way to do it, you've got the uh, put options. Put options would be the holders that are lending out their shares um, for a right to sell the shares at a particular strike price in the future. So again, what's nice about this is they get a good indication here pretty quickly of what the expiration date is here. Right? And I can see five strikes. Um, I think that these would be 100 shares. So it'd be 500 shares um, for a, I'm just reading this here for the first time here. Um, yeah, so as of today, the expiration on 9.18 that we'd have a, um, Five strike, and that the median price or the mean price here, um, 330, 330, 21 cents um, a share, essentially, for a strike price. Um, yeah, it gives you a pretty good, there's going to be a lot of volatility here. So, this is going to be a pretty interesting space to kind of watch here. Now, we have an entire chapter in the CFA Institute thing 
on options pricing. So I don't want to, I'm not trying to get too much into it here. I'm just trying to get enough into it so that you have an understanding of why is the market doing what it's doing this week? Um, and kind of motivating it a little bit further. Why, it's not just cool to just be able to pick stocks. I mean, that's not really what we're trying to do here, but we're trying to understand why the market is moving the way that it's moving. And now we have an understanding that the reason why Tesla is moving the way it's moving is because of um, what's going on in the options market. If we do the same here for Apple. Now, um, we can also see uh, Fris is asking when our first exam is. Levi is correct. We do not have exams. That would be absolutely correct. Uh, we don't have exams. Um, I think on the first day of class, we decided we were going to do these kinds of like, I'm going to try to develop some standard for some kind of project. The project that maybe you could hopefully use Bloomberg to complete. Um, but again, my uh, sense of things, my assessment of you in this class is going to be, if you're attending class and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, um, that's going to be good enough for me. Um, and if it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for you. Um, in the sense that um, I think we're all adults here and I think, um, uh, sorry, I will not move my head back. Um, so exactly as Levi said, it participation in the CFA material, Bloomberg material, I mean, attending class is important. Thank you, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, for Apple, same kind of thing here. Um, for Apple, we, we're seeing the same kind of thing here that we could look at the options performance. And again, we're going to see the call side and the put side of this um, and get a pretty good sense of how the options market is trying to predict the future for, so for a stock that's a little bit, a little bit less volatile. Well, it's actually still pretty volatile because today, even if we look at it today, it was still pretty volatile today. Down eight bucks. So still down quite a bit. Okay. Um, if, sorry, going back to the other thing I wanted to share though. Going back to this, going back to this, going back to the CFA Institute website, which again, you should hopefully all be logged in. You should all know how to log into it. After you created your account, log out, close the window, then just do login. A little circle will turn. We'll then log in. I also mentioned that if you do register for the candidate material or the investors foundation program, after you do so, you have to log out completely and then log in directly into the investment material area. Oh, so you can't, can't go because, explore. Because it bugged out for, for yeah. me. So I might, I not have to, I might not have to do that again after you get in, but just for the first time. Okay. So I clicked on my account. And then you again click on investment foundations program here. And again, if you look at the syllabus, like Chris is doing as a good student, don't worry about these exam attempts. Um, in the syllabus, they were listed as determining your entire grade, but then I realize it's a pretty shitty way to design a class. So I'm clicking on uh, the materials here. learning ecosystem. 
So I've now posted chapter one. Uh, tonight or tomorrow, I'll post chapter two. Um, chapter two is going to be all about ethics and ethics um, within this. Although the book makes it sound like ethics is the hardest part of the CFA exam, as well as this investment foundations. I don't know. Uh, not that I'm trying to be cocky about any particular section here, but the ethics and regulations. I mean, it's just basically trying to cover the holes of where um, the laws and regulations don't cover. So basically, what is it that it takes to be a, um, what is it that takes to be a, um, sorry, I'm just checking this here just to make sure. Sorry, I'm doing this so that, okay, perfect. I uh, just trying to make sure everyone can hear you. Um, the ethics and regulate, the ethics are just trying to cover the holes that laws and regulations don't cover. So chapter two, which I'll be making the video for here, um, will cover this ethics, um, cover this ethics chapter. So again, hopefully by this point, you're now comfortable with you know where the learning ecosystem is. This week, you'll then start to be logging into Bloomberg and exploring around there, trying to get your certification there because it's actually going to be pretty easy. If you're hardcore, I bet you someone by tomorrow will have done it because um, it only does take eight hours and I'm not even sure it takes eight hours. Um, so this week and into next week, just pound it out, get the Bloomberg market concepts thing done. Um, and then by that point, we're in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three by next week. Um, and again, we have to get through 20 chapters by the end of the semester. Um, so again, I'm not reading it to you. I'm presuming you can all read and you can work through the practice questions. We're all working towards the end goal being that around Thanksgiving, we're able to take at least mock exam A, hopefully. Again, going back to Fries's question, I'm not determining your grade, whether you can meet that deadline or not. But if you're trying to earn your tuition dollars and making this course worth it, hopefully by around Thanksgiving time, you're taking your mock exams so that sometime in December, you can pound this out and be done with this. Um, that's my goal, at least even for myself. Um, I'm trying to work ahead of everyone, but you know, I do what I can do. Um, so you're working on Bloomberg this week, but you're also going back to the CFA Institute thing and you're working on chapter one, chapter two, um, which I'll post this week, the slides and the, um, um, the slides and the um, video. Uh, keep in mind here, the, some of the slides, I'm copying and pasting things. It's gonna have the British spelling. Don't think that I've gone British all of a sudden. I'm just like sometimes just copying like phrases here putting it into the slide. Again, I'm making the slides just to make your life easy, not to make your life more difficult. But unlike, again, this will be the final thing I'll say for today's class. Unlike other courses most of you have taken with me, this one does require you to read the book a little bit more than you would have ever had to for some of my other classes. Okay. Um, I don't have much more to say today uh, just because I don't think, I think the ethics, usually if this wasn't chapter two, um, let's say this was, for instance, once we get to the meats and potatoes parts of this course, the, the, the things, well, economics, I'll have some things to say about that. But for some of you who are not accountants, and that would include myself, I'm going to do more teaching when it comes to this part. So don't, so if you think, wow, Shane's not even doing anything, he's not even teaching. I will teach more when we get to, well, <laughs> maybe, I'll have to rely on the accountants maybe a little bit more uh, to understand some of this, uh, but we'll kind of work through this all together. And I'll talk less about news when we get to that. I'll talk less about news when we get to debt securities. I'll talk less about news when we get to options, which you'll see right here. So again, if it seems a little easy right now, we're just kind of all getting our feet wet here and we're just all becoming comfortable with the systems that we're working with. Take advantage of this time 
to pound out the Bloomberg market concepts thing and just start playing around with the system. Again, to do Bloomberg, you're gonna to have to get um, authorized by me. If you do that tonight before, let's say 11 p.m., I'll be able to authorize you tonight and you'll be raring to go tomorrow. Um, if not, you'll just have to wait until I can authorize you. Oh, okay, uh, just like last week, I'll log off last, uh, just in case there are questions that all y'all have. Um, I'll log off last. Um, otherwise, um, I'll create a new weekly checklist and we'll just go from there. And some of you I'll see on Thursday, others of you I'll see next Tuesday. And uh, um, the videos are gonna be on modules, right? Yeah, so you'll already see the first one already in La Lima. If you go under modules and you go under chapter one, you'll actually already see my video for that one. I uploaded it last night. And you're gonna do two and three sometime this week. Yeah, I'll do two probably tonight and I'll probably do three probably tomorrow. All right, gotcha, see you next week. See you next week. Now, Michael uh, Fries, you and I are on for, are we, call, are we, I know we were kind of, I haven't confirmed with you yet, but are we on for talking tomorrow on the phone? Is that right? Uh, I heard you say, you're asking if we're on for tomorrow night. Is that right? Yeah, by phone? Yep, we're supposed to be on at for 7 p.m. Okay, that sounds good. I'll put a reminder in my phone. Okay. It, uh, so the, the screen you have up right now, is that where we should be going when we're to kind of document our studies for CFA? Yeah, because it's going to be on this learning ecosystem where you're going to take the mock exams, and it's going to be on this site where you actually take the exam. So a lot of the work that you're driving it through is all being driven through this learning ecosystem. And so it's kind of like, so it's kind of like, you know, for other classes where you have like Wiley Plus or, you know, my econ lab or my lab or whatever. That's what this is basically, except you don't have to pay for it. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is because I've, for chapters one and two, I was uh, reading and doing those quizzes at the end, but yeah. I was wondering where to go from there. Yep. So you just keep going through chapters. That's all you do. So after you do the practice questions, you just go on to the next chapter. Okay. Even if you're ahead of me, I would suggest still do it because there's going to be some chapters here, which are going to be, these initial ones are really easy. I mean, uh -huh. even myself, I'm dreading the accounting one because I'm not an accountant. So um, uh -huh. I'm going to have to do a lot of learning myself to pound through that one. Um, so, yeah. So, to get on this uh, page that you're on right now, just yeah. log in, that's it? Yeah, and just keep pounding okay. through it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a question about the sure, terminal access, the terminal access. Mm -hmm. So I, tried to make an account but i got yep. an error for it, it let me, me i need to try, the email. let me try to see if i can log in here i don't know if that's the authorization you're talking about though it might be it might not be let's see okay. So waiting to log in here. 
Has anyone ever noticed this thing? Uh, we don't have too many of us on here now. We just have Michael and you, Jasmine. If you use your microwave near the Wi-Fi thing, your Wi-Fi totally goes out. Does anyone notice this on there? Or is it just a... No, is it just me? Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Were you talking specifically to Jasmine? Jasmine, or you? I didn't quite catch what you said. I was saying if you use your Wi Fi near the um, microwave, that the microwave cancels it out and you can't end up using it. Your Wi Fi? Oh, oh, it's kind of Sorry. Chatting, I'm really having a hard time understanding what you're saying. Uh, I was saying that the if you use your um, microwave near your Wi Fi, uh, it knocks out the Wi-Fi. That's a good, yeah. I never, I don't know. Oh, well, it does. I mean, I'm telling you it does. So it's interesting if it doesn't, then. Interesting. Uh, I actually see. got rid of my Wi-Fi anyway. I just use a hot, hot spot. Oh, I guess that's a way to do it. Yeah, okay, so I'm waiting for this to log in here. And I'm not sure Starting to get raped by Time Warner. I mean, <laughs> Oceanic, yeah, I guess I'm still doing that. I'm waiting to log in here. I don't know why it's still waiting here. What were you oh. talking about again? The CFA? Um, the CFA Institute, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Or which one? The what CFA um, Institute.org. You wanted to know about that? Well, no, so that's, so this would be different. Which one are you talking about, Jasmine? Are you talking about Bloomberg or are you talking about CFA? I'm not talking about the Bloomberg, the Bloomberg yeah. but yep. I'm saying yep. like, you were saying in the beginning of class that you were gonna call me after class. Oh yeah, about this, yeah. So you can stay on and, and Michael, you can stay on too if you just wanna see what I'm doing here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so the link would be here, BMC login. So that's this portal.bloombergforeducation.com slash register. Okay, so mine's already showing as logged in because I guess I was trying to log in before. Um, <laughs> apparently, if I logged out, it would show me the other side, but I don't want to get out of it now that I'm in here. Um, so, right, so I can already see you now. It does show that you're signed up. Yeah. yeah, and I just entered in the class code. So you did it correctly. You did everything correctly so far. Um, now, let's go here. So now, did you follow the next steps? Um, now that you're approved for, you now need to create a, uh, a terminal login. Have you been able to, oh wait, no, you have to wait until I. Yeah, because yeah. I got it twice and yeah. then I got rejected. Okay, so let's see here. Let's do this quickly here. How many Jasmines can there be? Okay, so I've now turned it on for you. Okay, so I don't know. Okay, so I want you to log into your Bloomberg for Education account. That's that portal that. Yeah, the I'm way Okay, okay, so now. Let's go back to. because I've turned you on. Okay, and it should have sent you an email, but maybe it didn't, but this would be your customer number, 304-41939. That might be important for us to know. That's your unique Bloomberg customer number. Um, okay, we're gonna watch this video together here. Oh, here we go. Dude, here we go. Let's go back here. Okay, here you go. We're on step four. That's under uh, terminal access, and I went through the steps, and then it gave me afterwards. Oh. Okay, so you've done these steps. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Hmm. 
But I just seen the Bloomberg email, so they got what? I'm reading it right now. Okay. Well, they wrote you, they, they wrote, uh, you got sent an email? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Okay. So you went through this wizard. It would have. So it says to reach out to a faculty member to authorize the account. So you can create your terminal login. And then once authorized, you'll be able to create your terminal login directly on the terminal access app. Or app, sorry. Okay, so here it says here, if a user is disabled, the user will not be able to create. Okay, but I have enabled you because it's a short. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to retry yep, and then I'll let you know because yep. you did authorize me. Yep, so try it now. I'll, I'll wait on. Okay. Is it working or no? Uh, it's not working. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, it made it look like it was pretty easy on this time. Mm, let's see here. Let's go back to the video. Let's see if there's a step I'm forgetting. Okay, so you, you logged into the Bloomberg for Education site, then you went on terminal access, is that correct? Yes. And then you typed in your email address, the one that was provided, and then you put in your phone number, correct? Yep. Okay. So are you able to get to that step? Is it sending you the very I'm able to get to the password and then when I click create account, that's when I get the notification of the error. Okay, so let me watch the rest of this. Okay, so you're not getting to this stuff, is that correct? No. Okay. Okay, so uh, you stay, are, do you, are you rushing off to anything right now, Jasmine? No. Okay, so you stay logged in with me. Uh, Freeze, do you have anything? Um, otherwise, I'm going to call the help desk. And... I, I wanted to sign up for the Bloomberg. Yeah. But uh, we can do that tomorrow night if that's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds fine to me. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, I'll talk to you then. Matt. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow okay. night. Thanks. Yep. Okay, Jasmine, you stay on here. I'm gonna go into my Bloomberg. Did you stop the lecture? I'm sorry. Did you stop the lecture? Uh, no, but I'll do that now. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me do that now. Thank you. 
connection stuff. 